Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Central. Welcome uh, on any of our campuses, wherever you are. Uh, we are with you, you are with us, and we're aware. And any of you who are experiencing this online, whether it's in the city, the state, the nation, or somewhere uh, around the world, wherever you are, man, uh, we are thinking and praying for you as well. So, hey, glad that you're here. Here's what I need you to do. Open up your Bibles to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. And if you don't know where Jonah is, it's about at the end of the Old Testament. I could give you some other books that's in between, but I'm only going to confuse you because it's a little book. So just go to the back of your Bible of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament ends about two-thirds of the way into your Bible. So about two-thirds of the way through your Bible, you're going to find the book of Jonah. While you're finding the book of Jonah, uh, I want to have a pastor to congregation on a little talk, okay? I, I want to share something. I want to ask something of you. It's hard to believe that Christmas is uh, right around the corner, but it is, and uh, I don't know what memories you have of Christmas as you grew up, but my guess is you probably had a lot of fond ones. And uh, <clears throat> there, there's some people um, who, who really struggle uh, at Christmas time uh, because they just don't, uh, they don't have the means or circumstances in life or whatever. So as a church, what we've done for a year, literally decades, is we've just committed ourselves to partner with parents to try to, uh, like, literally uh, bless their kids and so that they, they have the same kind of memories, of w just wonderful memories. So <clears throat> what we do is we have this thing now we call Fill the Sleigh, and you can see it in the lobbies wherever you are. Um, and there, there are posts and there's bags and there's, uh, like, a, a, an item. And it's, it's basically what we're saying is, would you mind going and buying that item? You don't have to wrap it. Just bring it and put it in that bag. And uh, what's going to happen is, is we're going to collect all these toys. Now, if you go, I hate to shop. I want to help, but I don't want to shop. You can go online. You can just dedicate, uh, you, you can dedicate money for Fill the Sleigh. And we'll have staff that will go purchase the things that need to be purchased. And you can contribute that way. Or if you're just experiencing this online and there's, you know, there's no physical way for you to do that. But here's what's going to happen. Here's the cool part that I want to explain to you. It used to be that Central Christian Church was the hero behind the story of what we would do for little kids. And I remember one time walking in as we, we gave a whole bunch of toys to some parents' kids and their parents, I really felt bad for them. And I said, no more, no more. So what we've done is we've partnered with the schools and on, around all of our campuses. Last week you saw somebody from the community of Mesa talk about the difference that's made. All of our church, all of our campuses, the schools around them, we go to the schools and we simply say, uh, who needs help? And then they do the sorting uh, of who needs help. We deliver all these toys to the school. The school give them to the, gives them to the parents. The parents give them to the kids. And Central Christian Church is out of the picture. And I think that's the way it ought to be. And the parents ought to be the heroes. And we ought to come alongside the schools. And so that's how we do it. All right. So it's kind of anonymous. It's not like, hey, aren't we all that? It's our chance as a church to make a huge difference. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to extend your heart, to extend your family this Christmas. And I'm going to ask you to take on some other kids. Okay, for a day. All right. Not for a lifetime, for a day. Where you just go, we'll bless them. We got those kids. We'll bless them. And together, we've got it organized. If you'll do your part, we're going to make a big difference. Can I get an amen from anybody as to this? Okay. I seriously hope you'll do this. All right. So let's get going here. I'm going to talk fast, strangely enough, but we're going to fly. So here's, uh, here's the deal. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to deliver a message here that without the Spirit of God's help, you're not going to believe, and I'm not going to be able to communicate well. So I'm going to stop right now and pray. And then we're going to go. So, Father, I do pray that you open our eyes. Help us to see what we need to see here. God, help us to not get lost on details. Help us to not miss the point, miss the story, and uh, waste uh, your time and our time. So, God, open our eyes to this. And through your spirit, help us to see what we're supposed to see. And I pray for this and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week we started a brand new series. We're calling it On the Run. It's a, it's a story of the life of Jonah. Most of us have heard about Jonah and uh, we, we go, okay, I kind of got the idea. Sometimes we get it mixed up with Pinocchio and, you know, all kinds of other things. Uh, we, we get our facts wrong. So we're, we're slowing down. We're just taking a chapter a week. And, and so we're in chapter two 
right now. Now, before we get to chapter two, though, I got to review what we talked about last week. I got to review for two reasons. You might not have been here last week and, and you, don't, you, you weren't tracking, um, but you can't really understand chapter two without having a good grasp of chapter one. So let me just remind you of chapter one. OK, so it, it's the story of this man named Jonah. Uh, he's a prophet of God. And he uh, lives in northern Israel, and he gets a call from God that he's to go preach to the Ninevites, uh, and it's a 550-mile trek to the northeast that he's supposed to make, and it looks like this on a map. So again, you can see this is real people, not quite like that. That's not really what it looks like, but there it is. Okay, so uh, Jerusalem to Nineveh. 550 miles northeast. Now, he's not technically in Jerusalem, but that map gives you an idea of the perspective. He's in, in northern Israel, which is just a little north of Jerusalem. Okay, so that's the assignment. But here's the deal. Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and the Jewish people do not like the Assyrians. In fact, Jonah can't stand the Assyrians because they're really, really bad people. And so he says, no, I'm not going to do it. And he decides that he's going to run for his life and he's going to disobey. He's going to go to a different place. Instead of going to Nineveh, he's going to go to a place called Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is as far away from Nineveh as you can get. So he was supposed to go that direction. He goes, he's headed 2,500 miles to the west. Tarshish is a very wealthy city. It's at the end of the trade routes. It's right there by the Straits of Gibraltar. The ancient city of Char Tarshish was very rich. It traded in silver and gold, and ships would come laden with silver and gold. And uh, he hops on a ship, and he's going, I'm getting out of here. Because I heard what happens in Tarshish stays in Tarshish, and that won't be known. But, but here's the point. If you want to run away from God, here's the thing, church. I want you to understand. There will always be a ship to, to, headed toward Tarshish that you can get on. And he found one, and he got on it, and off he goes. Now, what happens is, is while he's on the Mediterranean, the, this huge storm comes up. And, and it, the, the word last week told us that God sent the storm. And the seasoned sailors began to freak out. They just began to freak out. They're, they go, we have never seen this. And they're, and they're scared for their lives. And I don't know if you remember uh, Gordon Lightfoot's song, uh, the wreck of, you know, the Edmund Fitzgerald, if you remember this song. It, it was 1975, this month, a few days ago, that that ship sank. And uh, the, the lyrics in that song, you know, the good ship and crew were a bone to be chewed. That's Gordon Lightfoot. This good ship and crew were a bone to be chewed by the storm that God sent on the Mediterranean this day. But the difference between the Edmund Fitzgerald and this ship is that the Edmund Fitzgerald sunk and everyone died, and everyone survived this storm. They survived the storm, literally, they began to pray to God, and it's a process we talked about last week, it was other gods first, and then to God. They pray to God, they become saved, and, uh, and basically, they're trying to get the ship to land. They, they realize they can't do it, they figure out Jonah is the issue, and so he, they ask, well, what do we do? And they said, throw me overboard. And they don't want to throw him overboard, but they can't get out of the storm. So finally they relent and they throw him overboard. And uh, the storm uh, subsides, the, the, the waves calm, and uh, Jonah's pretty sure he's just going to die. He's off drifting away. Now, that's not the end of the story. Okay, now I, I, want you to, uh, I want you to do something. I want you to, do you remember as a kid ever being put in timeout? Anyone? Am I the only one who has? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God is here. He sees your honesty and your dishonesty. No. You, okay. Uh, let me change the question. How many of you ever put your kids in timeout? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at the hands go up. What is timeout? Timeout is uh, that corner or that chair or that place. You need to go spend some time alone, right? You need to go think. You need to go consider your behavior and the consequences. You need to go figure some things out. I need you to understand what's going to happen is Jonah's on the run. It's going really bad. And God goes, okay, uh, you, Jonah, time out. He's going to send him to time out. Now, how he's going to do that is found in chapter 1, verse 17, the last verse of the first chapter. I didn't read it last weekend. It actually begins the second part. So Jonah 1.17 says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Time out. Jonah, time out. Now, I want you to stop for just a moment. Think about how crazy this story is. You, you're doing it. And, and you might be clicking your tongue and, you know, rolling your eyes like, oh, come on. You, you got to be kidding. Three days, three nights. Who comes up with this stuff? Okay, what's interesting, um, three days to three nights is going to parallel what Jesus is going to do in the ground. But, um, and Jesus is going to reference the three days and three nights. So, so what's going to happen is um, you're going to read this and everything inside you is going to be uh, uh, skeptical. 
and go, there, no, no way, no, mm -mm, no, I'm out. That's impossible. I, I want to say this to you. If you have that reaction, I'm cool with it. I really am. I get it. I get, I'm so glad you're here, even if you think this is unbelievable. But I want to help you to understand something. Uh, there's a couple points I want to make here on this. Number one, Jonah is not a story about a fish. That's the first thing you need to understand. If you get stuck on the fish, you're going to miss the point. Now, the second thing I want to say about this is you've got to understand there's only one way this happened. There's only one explanation for it and no other. The only chance it, it, it happened this way is if God did a miracle. Now, before you click your tongue or roll your eyes about miracles, let's just stop for a minute and say this. If you don't believe in miracles, then there's a bigger issue. Now, let me, let me explain. We live in a natural world governed by natural laws, laws that are repeatable, that are observable, that are, you know, you can document them, you can, the, the laws of the land. Supernatural is when something above the natural law intercedes or interacts or, you know, intersects the natural world. And you go, well, that never happens. But see, if you say that never happens, then I've got to say, what are you going to do with the virgin birth? Because Jesus came supernaturally. And if you want to throw that out, and a lot of people do, you throw that out. I just want to say, I want to stand here and testify to you. I believe in the virgin birth. I don't, it does not cause me any heartburn. I also, by the way, believe in the resurrection. You go, come on, pastor, a guy rising from the dead. I, I don't know, man. I expect God to do stuff like that. I, I wouldn't want to follow a God that can't do stuff. I expect him to come in supernaturally. And I expect him to exit supernaturally. And I also expect him to do all kinds of supernatural things. Well, he's alive because see, every healing that Jesus did, every miracle, walking on water, feeding the 5,000, it's all supernatural. And if you don't have room for a supernatural God, you're going to be locked in a natural world and you're going to have no resources beyond natural resources. It had to be a miracle. So if it's a miracle, I'll just put it in that category. Now, you need to understand, I don't argue with miracles. I pray for miracles and, and, and I rejoice in them when they happen. Every prayer I pray is asking for supernatural intervention. That's what prayer is. God, I'm pleading with you. Get involved in this. Change the course of this. That's prayer. Do you believe or not? I do. So I, I, don't, I, just, I don't get hung up on this. All right. Now, with that said, I, I want to I say this. Some people go, Pastor, you're a fool. There's no possible way a fish would eat a person. Well, funny you used to say that. I don't know if you saw this. June 12th of this year, I'm going to quote the Cape Cod Times about a 56-year-old lobster diver by the name of Michael Packard that was, um, uh, he was swimming off Provincetown, Massachusetts. He was lobster diving. He said, I saw all kinds of schools of fish going by. He's plucking lobsters off the bottom. And next thing he knew, it got really, really dark. He had no idea what happened, but it got really, really dark. He, quote him, I could sense I was moving and I could feel squeezing with the muscles uh, in, in, in his mouth. He, he thought he had been swallowed by a great white shark, but he said, I never felt any teeth. And so he's inside something. He doesn't know what he's inside and he's trying to figure it out. But once inside, it, this is what he said. I'm just quoting him, all right? This is a real story. You can go read this, all right? I was completely inside. It was completely black. I thought to myself, there's no way I'm getting out of here. I'm done. I'm dead. All I could think of was my boys. They're 12 and 15 years old. Actually, what had happened is he got swallowed by a humpback whale, and uh, he was inside this well, and, and, and then um, not after a long time, this fish goes, okay, that's going to give me indigestion or something. I don't know. Spit him out. Spit him out. Ended up in a hospital. Hyenas. Uh, the city of hyenas. There he is. This is the guy. And uh, I'm telling you this story not to prove that Jonah is true, but to prove that bizarre things happen. And guess what? Without God having anything to do with it, a fish can swallow a human. All right? So it can happen. Now, again, that make you believable. But I'm just saying. See, the problem we're going to have with Jonah is, did this actually happen? I want to say the point of it is not did it or did it not actually happen. Was that real? Was it, was it a fable? Was it an allegory? Was it a parable? Here's the point. What I know is real in this story for a fact is that what Jonah did, I do. And I'm willing to go on record as saying what Jonah did, you do. And that I don't debate. 
I, I, I sometimes run away. Do you remember being a kid and running away? How many? Come on. God is here, man. Better not lie. How many of you remember running away as a kid? Look at the hands. Look at the hands. Okay, how far did you get before you realized this is dumb? My guess is around the block. All right? You started to realize, I have no food. I'm hungry. I forgot my pajamas or whatever. And so you decide to repent and go home. Don't you think that as we get older, we would learn there's no point in this running away thing? You know what's fascinating? The older we get, the more we run. You grow into it, not out of it. We run from God first and foremost. We run from God. We, we reach a point in our lives where, and I don't know how it played out, but you go, I'm not listening anymore. And I remember clearly in my life when I, when I literally sh shoved God off. But often it's like your parents are bringing you to church and you go, the minute I don't have to go, I'm not going. And some of you go, yeah, and I know you're here now, so something happened. But that's the memory. So many people, it's just like, God, get out of my life. And we run away. But we don't just run away from God. We, want, we run away from our spouse. We run away from our kids. We run away from trouble, stress, job problems. We run. And you would think we would learn. So just like Jonah, we run. We see ourselves in him. We see him in ourselves. And that's why he's so worth studying. Now, again, by, I, this is important. I know I'm belaboring this. When we run, where do we go? We go to dangerous we, we go to dangerous places. We go, we go to danger. We run to danger. Jonah's going to go get on a boat and get on a sea. That's stupid. When we run, we run to dangerous places. We run to dangerous relationships. We run to dangerous substances. We run to dangerous situations. We run to, we run to danger. It's, it's ridiculous. As if somehow the danger that we're running from is less than the, the simple obedience of what we're being called to do. We run to dangerous uh, places and people, and the second thing that happens is we begin to self-destruct. When we run, we self-destruct. Everyone who loves us knows we're self-destructing. Everyone who knows us says, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Explain to me why you would, and then they'll put the thing on. Why would you leave your spouse? Why would you have that affair? Why would you buy that thing you can't afford? Why would you, and they see it plain as day. Why would you? But you don't. And people who love you will get in your grill and go, What's your problem, man? What are you doing? And yet uh, we don't listen. We just go, you don't get it. And we just kind of do our thing. We also, we avoid people who speak wisdom in our lives and we avoid places where we'd hear wisdom. And frankly, a church is one of the places where you hear wisdom because we're going to read from the word of God. You go, I don't want to hear from God. We're running. Why would I want to hear what he has to say? So we tend to self-destruct. Uh, I want to point out something that's important you understand. When you want to run away from God, you can relax, he's not gonna chase after you. You can relax. You know why he won't chase after you? Because if he chased after you, you'd just run farther and faster. You, you, it would just, you, to spite him, you would just go further into trouble and danger. But what's cool is, you know what, wherever you're running to, he already is. Just so you know, he already is there, he's there. So you don't have to, when you finally decide, I'm gonna turn around and come back, you don't have to travel all the distance again to get back to where you started. No, wherever you, wherever you are, when you're ready to turn around, God's ready to embrace you. He waits for you and he waits patiently and uh, he's, he's good. Now, I said last week, God doesn't wanna pay you back. He's not out to get you, he's not trying to pay you back. He just wants to bring you back because you ran away. He wants to bring you home. That's a story, that's it, pretty simple. Now. Uh, let's just talk about what it's like to be stuck in a fish. Uh, how many of you have had that experience? Uh, Jonah, Jonah. Jonah had that experience. What, what does one learn spending time inside a big fish? What do you do? Well, you're kind of in solitary confinement, yes? You've got a lot of time on your hands. You've got a lot of... I, I think what probably happens when you're inside a fish and you're stuck, you start reflecting on things you've learned. Notes to self. Um, things, you say things like, you know, if I would have known then what I know now, if I would have had any inkling that my running away would reach this destination, I think we'd look at our, des our decision differently. You go, you know what, I, I got to remember next time. And you would, you know, start scratching out some things. Um, what you get in the second chapter of Jonah is a, a number of things. You get a prayer 
We're going to read a prayer. It's not long. It's not long. It's just a prayer. It's, it's like you're getting his insights, reflections, ponderings. It's as if you're, you're like reading his journal. Like uh, Jonah's going, what I must never forget about being inside a fish. And he just writes it out. And that's what we're literally going to see here in just a moment. So you could call these, I guess, insider insights. Insider insights. Like, what do you know? What do you discover when you're inside a fish? These are your insights. That's what you have in chapter two, which we're going to look at. Um, here's the first thing I think you discover. That God always provides, but not always how we might imagine he will provide so let me take you back to Jonah 117. We've already read this, but it's, it's, the, it's the tea that the whole thing's, you know, teed up on. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. The Lord provided. And, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. A big fish, three days, three nights. Who thinks of this stuff? Well, it's all kind of setting up the story of Jesus that's going to come hundreds of years later. It's kind of helping you to understand, and Jesus is going to reference this uh, when, when he lives his life. But here's what I need us to think about. We often think of God as like a Santa Claus, like a God that only provides, you know, really, really good things. We never think of God as providing something as difficult as a huge fish to swallow you and keep you for three days and three nights. We don't tend to think that way. We, we think that God will give us everything we want and that if we walk with God, no problems are going to come our way. It's all going to be, you know, a bed of roses and it's going to be awesome. And yet it's often not because we forget something about God's nature. He's a father and we're his children. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, it says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? So what Jonah needed was discipline from God, and God sent a fish to discipline him. Now, the word provided is the word appointed, commissioned. God literally, literally communicated with this fish. And I, how do you, I don't know, man. I had some conversation. Hey, Mr. Big Fish, we'll call him Harry. Hey, Harry, I need a favor. What's up, boss? I got this dude, he's kind of drowning right now. Now let me send you his coordinates. Uh, can you go do me a favor? Can you go get him? Yeah, what do you want me to do? Well, listen very, very carefully. I need you to swallow. Do not chew. <laughs> Real important detail. I need you to swallow him and I just hold him in solitary confinement. And then I'm gonna give you bearings in which I'm gonna direct you to a place. And, and when I, on my cue, I want you to spit him out. Got it? Whatever you say, boss. Okay, so somehow he communicates to this fish. And uh, so he's on a journey. Jonah 2.1. Now, we're going to go fast. Jonah 2.1. From inside the fish, while all that's going on, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. This is fascinating. At no point did Jonah feel the need to pray before. When he's thinking about going to Nineveh, not praying. When he's deciding not to go to Nineveh, not praying. When he's going to go to Joppa, not praying. When he's going to get on a ship to Tarshish, not praying. When he was on the ship in the storm, where was he? All the sailors were on the deck praying. Where was he? Sleeping underneath. Now he's in a fish. And now he's thinking, I should probably pray. Why didn't he pray before? Because he's like me. He's like you. When we got it, we got it, man. When we don't need help, we don't need help. When we're okay, we're okay. Oh, I'm busy. I don't have time. And uh, he's going, I'm, I got it. I'm in control. When you think you're running it, you don't pray. But now he's in a mess. And what kind of audacity does it take to think that after you've run away and you've rebelled and you've done all this, that God's going to give you the slightest hearing as to your request? That's what we think. But Jonah is in a fish, in solitary confinement, middle of timeout, has nowhere to go and nothing to do, might as well pray. And so he prays. And uh, Jonah chapter two, uh, no, Jonah, yeah, chapter two, verse two. In my distress, I love that phrase. Because you know when you're gonna start praying? In your distress. In my distress, I called to the Lord. 
And he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. He's reflecting on this. Now, he's not saying, I hope you'll hear me. He's reflecting on what happened. I was in this fish. I was in despair. I was in distress. And I prayed and you heard me. How does he know he heard him? Because what's going to happen? Well, you go to, go to verse 3. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea. You hurled me. This is fascinating. Who hurled Jonah into the depths? If you know the story from last week, who hurled him overboard? The sailors hurled him overboard. But Jonah goes, you did it. In that horrible thing that happened, I saw your hand. You did it. And by the way, if you haven't figured this out, you know, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a storm and, and, and the Lord caused the storm and the Lord caused sailors and the Lord caused the fish. Hmm, that's interesting. Jonah could have thought it was all just happening to him. But folks, there's design behind this. And I want to suggest there's this design behind your life and there's design behind my life. But let me show you, if you summed up everything we've read about Jonah so far, one word would sum it up and you probably haven't even caught the word. The word is down, down. He went down to Joppa, it says. He was going down to Tarshish. He, he went down in the boat. They threw him overboard. He went, began to go down. He was swallowed by a fish and it went down. How far down do you have to go before you hit rock bottom? How far down? You see, his life is on a trajectory. It's only going one direction and it has nothing to do with a music group. It's just going down. How far down does Jonah have to go? How far down do you have to go? How far down do I have to go before I realize this destination? How far can I fall? Uh, second thing I, I think we could pick up on here is distress. It seems to be God's just great instructor. Let me pick this up. I'm going to be in Jonah chapter 2. I'll, I'll just begin with verse 3. Jonah 2, 3. I'm, I'll, I'll stop at 7, all right? So I'll just read all this. You hurled me into the depths. God, you did that into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I, I've been banished from your side. That's the feeling. God, you've thrown me overboard, and I am, uh, I'm just over. I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. So at some point, he looked up. At some point, in all the despair and, and going down, he looks up. The engulfing waters... Uh, I will look again at your, toward your holy temple. I'm going to get out of this. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. That's a glorious picture. To the roots of the mountain, I sank down. The earth be, uh, beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. What's the pit? Rock bottom. Hmm. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. See, I want you to understand something. This is where this is really personal. Listen to me. He's going down, 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 down to rock bottom. He's inside a fish. He's down, and it's dark. It's dark. He's inside a fish. He's down, and he's, it's dark, and he begins to feel distressed and despair, and desperation. Are you there yet? Are you there? Because what's going to happen when you find yourself in that place? He's in pain, and you might be in pain. But somebody said God, uh, C.S. Lewis said, pain is God's megaphone to get your attention. We said, we all think we're invincible. We're immortal, man. You kidding? We're indestructible. And we think that until we find ourselves in so much pain. We've got not any of that. And uh, the third thing I want to point out here is that in the end, the choice is ours to make. Me meaning the condition that we all find ourselves in, you he's giving you the decision as to what you want to do with the mess you find yourself in. And in fact, I want to show you something. In Jonah 2, 8 and 9, and we're just almost done. Almost, it's just that quick. Jonah 2, 8 and 9 says, um, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Just stop right there. That sums up our culture. We're clinging to all sorts of things that are just worthless 
idolatries. Can't do anything to solve our problem. Can't fix it. Can't just, we're holding, clinging on to things. And uh, we won't let go. But I, he said, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, God, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. Let me tell you what he's saying. God, I repent. I repent. I, I will go. I'll turn around. I was running away. I'm turning around. God, I realize you're right here. I'm signing up for duty. You want me to go to Nineveh? I'll go to Nineveh. We'll see this next week. I'll go to Nineveh. I promise you, get me out of this mess. Get me out of this fish. And I will go to you. Now, I want to ask a question. Again, I've already asked it. How far down do you have to go? You see, what's amazing is God is literally saying to you, this will end as soon as you want it to. The pain you're in will end the minute you want it to. There's a great story told in the Old Testament. I don't have time to go into it other than to say this. Moses was sent to Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, the king of Egypt. And, and they, he was holding the Israelites in captivity. This is the book of Exodus. And, and Moses was told to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and, and that he wasn't going to do it. So God was going to give him some plagues to inflict on the land of Egypt. One of those plagues was the, what was called the plague of frogs. Frogs, frogs everywhere, frogs everywhere. Frogs in your refrigerator, frogs in your bed, frogs in your bath, frogs everywhere. And, and uh, basically, uh, Moses is going to have this, comp- Pharaoh's going to relent, he's going to repent, he's going to go, okay, okay, I give. And then he's going to ask a simple question, I'm going to show it to you. When do you want relief? Watch this, this is unbelievable. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave you to, on, I, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. What's your answer, Pharaoh? When do you want relief? Look at the next word. What's the answer? Say it out loud. Tomorrow, tomorrow. tomorrow. I'm going to stop there, but tomorrow. No, yeah, I just want one more night of misery. I just haven't had enough frogs look in my face yet. I just, seriously, I need one more night to sleep with these frogs. How stupid can we be? All he's got to say is now, I'm done with it. And relief would come immediately. He's just like us. I know, I think later, I know know my life's a mess. I think I still have a little to go till I hit rock bottom. I think the low, I think the bottom's a little lower. Give me a couple more days to be in misery. It's crazy. Um, 2 Corinthians 6.2. In the, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And, the, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Why would you want to live in misery? I just get one more night inside this fish, God. That's all I want. Just one more night. I want four days and four nights. Can we get it? Well, so let's finish it up here. Uh, Jonah 2.10. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Too much information. Amen? It vomited. Literally, it's the, the fish hurled Jonah. I think Jonah's getting tired of getting hurled. The fish hurled Jonah. Uh, what does that mean? What, he, he vomited. He puked. He tossed his cookies. Whatever phrase you want to put there, this fish is... Now, where do you suppose this fish, Jonah? I don't know, but I, I got a pretty good clue. Right about the beginning of the road to Nineveh. Told the fish, I want you to go to these GPS coordinates, get there. And it expels him. He goes flying out of the fish. I don't know. Flying out of the fish. Now, let me just point something out. He's got a lot of miles yet to travel, right? But now he's coming out of the fish. Guess what? Guess what? He, he, you know what his life's all about right now? He's covered in fish goo and tartar sauce. He's a mess. Wouldn't it just have been easier? Jonah, just do what you're told. Just go do what God said to do. No, no. I, I, I need to be doused in fish goo. Fish goo. 
and tartar sauce before I'll obey. First time obedience would be so much better. So off he goes. Now we'll see what happens when he gets there next week, but what's the point of all of this? And this is the conclusion. All right. What's the point of all of this? Let me just draw. There's a tendency within all of us to do some things. Let me point them out. Number one, to play, to play the victim and blame somebody else for our troubles. Hey, this is not my fault, man. This is not my fault. This happened because God caused a storm because those sailors just threw me overboard because this stupid fish uh, take no responsibility for the mess you're in. They did it to me. But the truth is, Jonah did this to himself. In my distress. Who caused your distress, Jonah? And if I can be so candid with you, can I just say most of my distress I caused myself? Can you admit that too? That a lot of the things that have come your way, you, you brought those on. I do. In my distress that I brought on, Proverbs 6, 27, 28 says, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? It's not talking about running fast over the coals. Can you stand on hot coals and not burn up? Can you put coals in your lap and not burn yourself? To no. No. And that there are consequences to behaviors. These things happen. There's a saying I have no idea who to attribute it to, but you might have heard it. You get what you got when you do what you did. You get what you got when you do what you did. When you put hot coals on your lap, you get what you got because you did what you did. When you do that, that's what's going to happen. If you're tired of getting what you got, you got to quit doing what you're doing. You got to do something different. Life just has this way of pouring these consequences back on us. We want to blame somebody else. I think the point of Jonah, don't do it. Number two, I think we think we can outsmart God. We can outrun God. We can outmaneuver God. We can outthink him. I'll gun them. I think one of the things that we need to understand is you can't. You just can't. Third thing I want to point out is that I think there's a tendency within all of us to fail. And this is so important. Please give me your attention on this. That we fail to recognize that God's deliverance comes to us often in a way we'd never have thought of or associated. You see, Jonah would say, my big problem is I got swallowed by a fish. But the truth of the matter is, God sent salvation to me by swallowing me up in a fish. You see, the fish wasn't the problem. The fish was the solution to the problem of Jonah bobbing up and down in the Mediterranean with nowhere to go. Do you ever think about the stuff that happens in your life that you're going to want to blame God for might actually be sent from God? You're like, I lost my job. Where was God? I lost my job. I can't believe I lost my job. Could it be possible that God caused you to lose your job? And that the best thing that will ever prove to have happened in your life is you lost that job? Or I, I, you know, I prayed to God that this relationship would happen. I prayed to God that he would bring me and this person together and he didn't. Do you ever think that maybe what God did is save you by sending that breakup in that relationship? Do you ever think that maybe the reason you didn't get that contract or they left you was because God was saving you from something? See, we don't think like this. We just want to blame God when the actual solution might be the very answer. God's going, yeah, I got you. But you're going to have to have some time. In my own personal life, I've experienced this. That, that family crisis you're going through might actually be the solution that you've been praying for. Maybe something as simple as your car breaking down. Your car broke down. That's horrible. What's happening in my car? Break? Could that possibly be God preventing you from something you have no idea what he saved you from? Well, lastly, at some point, usually in our distress, we start to see things God's way. We start to go, okay, all right. Maybe I should turn towards God. This is the story of Jonah. And I want to remind you with what I said last week. It's never Never, never, never too soon to quit running from God. It's also, by the way, never too late. Never too late to quit running from God. It's never too soon, church, to turn toward God. It's never too late to turn towards God. What I love about God, among many things, is that when you turn to God, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't do like you do with your dog. You grab him by the back of the neck, put his nose in his mess, 
You, you need to know, did you do this? God never does that. He never rubs your nose in your problem. He just embraces you in your turn and welcomes you back home because he didn't come to pay you back. He came to bring you back. First John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, I'm adding that word, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Yeah, you're covered in fish goo and tartar sauce. Turn to God. He'll, he'll clean you up and he'll set you on the right path. So the big idea that I've been, I haven't said it, well, I'm going to close and I'm going to pray. Big idea. When your life is heading down, make sure your focus is looking up. That's the story of Jonah too. Let's pray. So God, uh, thanks as always for your word. Thanks for teaching. Thanks for Jonah. Thanks for the story. Thanks for the incredible application of the story to our lives. God, we've all run and we've all sank. And the question is, is how far do we run and how far do we sink before we see what's happening and we turn? And God, I thank you that you don't, you're not punitive in the sense that you delight in our misery. That when we turn you embrace, you clean us up, you get us on the right path and get us going the direction you knew was best for us all along. So Lord, I do pray for hearts to be sensitive to this. And again, I prayed it already. I can't, I don't have the words. Your spirit can do what your spirit can do. Help anyone who's in pain realize that there is a, a way out, that you love them and that you will uh, be there for them the minute they're done. No more nights with frogs, no more nights in the belly of a big fish. So uh, God, may we turn to you. Everyone you know, every story you know, God speak to us individually. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, next week, um, next week, you don't wanna miss next week. It's really, I mean, I can't believe, you will not believe what we're gonna study next week. We're going to be in Jonah 3 uh, next week. If you want to get ahead, read it this week. Come prepared, and we'll pick it up. God bless you guys. You're awesome. All right.